God. Amen. Amen. We are continuing today, and uh, I, I seems to be a little bit of a broken record, but I, I think it's important for us to understand this. It is summertime, and this is a very important uh, subject uh, to cover, considering there's so many people moving in and out, but I feel of necessity that we need to keep pressing forward and uh, letting God begin to talk to us today. So we've sort of talked in general, 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 it's the heat, generalities, there we go, I'm getting it out there. Uh, the last number of uh, weeks, we have been laying a very strong foundation over the last number of weeks as we've discussed sort of the overall picture. But starting this week and for the next little while here, we're going to start drilling down into each one of these sections and begin to really discuss in detail exactly what those mean and how they apply to our lives and how they can help you and I become more like a disciple of Jesus Christ. So today we're going to start in the very center, the very center dot. And again, I've got more of these. If you didn't get one of these last week, and you'd like to take one of these home with you that you can put on your fridge or put in your car or put somewhere so you can maybe at work, wherever you want to put this. Uh, I'll have these up here available for you. Um, after we're done here, you can take these. And we're going to start today right in the center dot. We've talked about humbly submitted, biblically formed, how they work together. We talked about how we go from the inside out. God works on the inside and it begins to work out in our areas of our life. And we can't change ourselves by changing the outside. We have to start with the heart and mind. But let's get a little farther if we can and get deep down into what it really truly means to be humbly submitted in our hearts. Because if we look at the definition and the, the, uh, the, uh, the model that we are following. Remember all the way back in the very first lesson we discussed, we talked about the fact that we are built, we are made, we were designed, we were created, we were put on this earth by God from the very beginning to be image bearers. He said, let us create us, let us, let us create man in our image. And that word image is literally an idol. It's a reflective. It's a representation. So from the very beginning, we were called to be image bearers. But if we don't know the image that we're trying to bear, how do we know if we're correctly following in the footsteps of Jesus? If we don't have a mirror, if we don't have something to compare ourselves with, and we don't look at that, then we don't know what areas in our life may need adjustment. So when we begin to look at Jesus and His actions, His attitudes, His words, we can find very quickly that at the core of everything Jesus did, it started with a heart that was submitted to the Father. Many times Jesus would say the words and He would he would say it directly and both indirectly that he was submitted to the will of the Father. All the way to the very climatic moment of his earthly life, the flesh part of God dying on the cross, he even prayed at that point, not my will, but thine be done. But I said it last week, I believe, and, and a little bit the week before, the prayer that he prayed in the garden did not start in the garden. The foundation for that prayer was laid because He was first and foremost submitted. A lot of you pray, God, I want your will. And that's great, but you haven't started with your heart being submitted. So you can't ask for the will of God in your life if your heart's not submitted. You've got to have a submitted heart before you can seek His will. So your heart will change when you dwell on Him more than yourself. Your heart will begin to change when you dwell on Him more than yourself. So let's get a little farther in here. Being humbly submitted is a supernatural position. Why do we say that? Because it's unnatural for you to submit to anyone. Submission is an unnatural thing. It is built in a child from the very beginning. 
to be independent, to do things their own way. And as a parent, you fight the battle from the very beginning of their existence. Who's going to be in charge? Because it's built in that child to be their own person, make their own decisions. You see a little two-year-old, three-year-old that doesn't understand anything. They walk over to mommy's vase and they reach out and you say, no. Look at you. No. No. Why? Because there's something in us naturally that doesn't want to be submitted. So being submitted is a supernatural position. Your heart, which is at the center of everything, is naturally only submitted to you, your pleasures, your concerns. But that is a heart of stone that God wants to soften and change within you so you can be more like Jesus. We often talk about the distinction. What makes us who we are as believers? What makes us who we are as disciples? Oh, we're here at church. That doesn't make us disciples. That doesn't distinctive. Really, what distinguishes a disciple starts at the very core, and that's who you're submitted to in your heart. Who's in charge of your life? Who's at the core of that? Notice, let's go back and look at something. As your heart will change when you dwell more on Him... Let's look in the scripture and say, the, Jesus kind of spoke these words to some disciples in Mark 8, 34, when he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The very core of that is the mission. Jesus made it known that if you're going to be his disciple, follow after him with the intent of becoming like him. Notice, that's a key phrase in here. We're following after Him to do what? To be more like Him. Let's stop just right there for a second before we go a little farther. A lot of people follow after Jesus, but don't intend to be like Jesus. But if you're going to follow Him and be a disciple, a disciple wants to reflect and be like the one that they are following. So it's not the desire to get you to follow Jesus more fervently. Because remember, we talked about that in the very beginning. How many of us, when we want to change our life, what do we do? Well, you got to pray more. Got to read your Bible more. You got to come to more church. And we try these things, and what happens? We fail. We fail. And then what do we think? We got to try harder. Or then what happens? We begin to think, well, we're just, we're just that messed up. And the desire is, and the, and the problem is, is that in our intent to change, our intention is to follow Jesus more fervently. But following Him is not the problem. It's being more like Him is the issue. I don't need to follow Him any greater. I need to, I need to desire to be more like Him at a greater level. Who are you trying to become today? Are you trying to become the, the definition of what, it, what you think a believer should be? Or are you looking at yourself in the mirror of the Word of God and saying, am I like Jesus? I, talked, I said this years ago, back in the, I think it was like the late 90s, early 2000s. I thought it was late 90s. There was a big deal that hit, the, hit, the, hit, the, hit, hit society, especially Christian, Christian society, and some of you remember this, it was the WWJD thing, right? I remember I had a WWJD thing I could put on my arm. What would Jesus do? The problem with that is, if we just try to copy what Jesus did, we'll never ever be able to do that, because you can't copy some their actions without becoming like them. So WWJD is just a behavioral modification. But we're not looking for a behavioral modification. We're looking for a modification that takes control of everything. I don't want my behavior to be modified. I want to be changed. The Christian world has become obsessed with behavioral modification. Change this, do this, be, be, be better over here. I don't want to change my behavior. I want to change because if I change, what I do will change. 
If you're trying to change your behavior today, I guarantee you, you will fail. Well, I'm having success. I didn't say you're not going to have any success. But you're going to eventually fail because you can't change yourself. Because if you could, you already would have done it. So you have to follow him with the intent of becoming more like him. There will have to be a major shift from your natural propensity to have your heart set on self. You have to deny yourself, which means that you will have to stop being passionately committed to you before you can be submitted to Him. You must come to the point when you say no to yourself being in charge so you can listen and respond to Him as the ruler of your life. Now, if you haven't written down anything yet and you're taking notes, you need to write this down. This will be a painful transformation. Submission is a painful transformation. I know I didn't just make you want to jump up and shout. Because submission will involve a cross. We want the painless route. But submission involves pain. Why? There is a dying that has to happen. A painful dying to self as the ruler of your life. And it will not give up leadership in your life easily or without a struggle. Can I get someone to say amen to that? You will not go down without a fight. You will not go down because you have one prayer meeting and you shed six tears. Because the moment you stop getting on that cross... Flesh has an amazing power of resurrection. And the moment you stop trying to be like Jesus, flesh says, ah, ha, ha, here's my opportunity. I don't care if you've been here for five minutes or 50 years. Trust me, the moment you stop, the moment your flesh takes over. Because until you breathe your last breath and you step over into glory, your flesh is going to desire to be in control of your life. In fact, the the Apostle Paul said, there inside of you right now, there is a war happening. There is a war. We want to talk about angels and demons. That's not the real war because Jesus already gave us the victory in that war. That's not the war that defines us. The war that defines us is the war that's happening in you right now where your flesh is fighting against your spirit. God is committed. Here's the, here's the, here is the exciting part. Before you're depressed and say, there's no hope for me. You're telling me it's too hard. Let's get to some good stuff. God is committed to help you in this process of dealing with your heart so you can be submitted to Him. Let's read the book of James. James chapter 4. James is going to describe to us how God is determined to change our hearts. James 4 verse 6 says, But He gives greater grace... Everybody say greater grace. Not just grace. He gives greater grace. This version here we're reading, the New King James says, gives more grace. He's not just going to give you grace. He's going to give you abundant grace. Therefore, it says, God opposed to the, is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your gloom to joy. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Before we get a little too deep here, something in this verse that really jumps out at me. We jump to the part that says, resist the devil and he will flee. Go back to that. Verse, what is this, verse 7? Try verse 7. There we go, right? This is a beautiful verse. And this is one of the things that I've been sort of hammering us on that we, when we read the scripture, we got to make sure we get it right. Because this is how we quote this verse. Resist the devil, he shall flee. So what do we do? We go around resisting the devil. And guess what? He's not fleeing. And we start getting the big guns out. I bind you in Jesus' name. And he ain't moving. Because why? There is a clause in the contract. 
The clause in the contract is submit to God. Then you can resist the devil and he will flee. Because you can't have authority if you're not under authority. And submission puts me under God's authority. And if I'm under God's authority, I have the power over the adversary in my life. You can stand there all you want, shake your head and speak Jesus. But if you're not submitted... I want to ask anybody here today to raise your hand and say how many of you are battling with things that you're trying to fight against but they're not going anywhere. Maybe, just maybe, the reason why you're not getting any victory in those areas is because your heart's out of alignment and you need to get your heart submitted so that you can have the authority that you need in your life to overcome these things. We want to resist the devil. I'm all about resisting the devil. But you can't resist the devil unless you follow the first part of that verse. Stop skipping to the good parts and read the whole thing. Submit to God. Then you can resist the devil. Let's go back to the verse. God is opposed to the proud, and that is what your heart is naturally like. Proud, focused on you and what you want. But God will oppose that in your life, meaning God will be the enemy of your pride. Sometimes we think it's the adversary fighting against us and we don't even realize it's God fighting against us because God is trying to help you overcome your pride by being your enemy. Amen. You could try to figure everything out. We try to get everything solved and figure out all the alternatives. And you know what? God just comes and goes. <gasps> and our world just goes in chaos. And then we get it all back together again. And we work so hard. And we put out all the fires. And we run around like crazy getting it all done. And finally, oh, and what happens? Oh, and we go, oh God. Oh God, my life is in such chaos. You got to help me. And he's like, I'm trying to, but you're not letting me. We start talking to people. I need help. I just got this problem, that problem, this problem, that problem. And we're trying to seek the Solution, that's not the solution. The word oppose means to array against. It is the picture of God align, align, aligning all the forces of heaven against your pride. Think about that. You want to hear it? You want to feel something that's intimidating? Picture in your mind, you may have seen it in pictures, maybe in a movie. Ancient warfare where they would line up armies and stand across a field from one another. Not like today where you hide in a bush or a tree or in a hole. But years ago in the, in the ancient times, in the Roman times and other times like that, even up to the Civil War, massive armies would stand across a field from each other. In fact, if you read a little bit of history, you'll notice that during the Revolutionary War, it's kind of funny, the British wore all red, big red hats. You thought, that's kind of dumb. Why would you want to blend in? The reason why they wore red and big red hats is because when they were standing across the field, the hats made them look taller and the red made them look more intimidating. So I want you to picture that and I want you to picture all the host of heaven across the field and there you are standing by yourself. That's how much God is trying to kill your pride. He's aligned all of heaven. All the resources of heaven are standing across the field. And there you're standing there with your little spear of pride. And all of heaven is coming against you. God will never look at your pride and give a nod and a wink and say, Oh, well, there you go again. It's okay. He will be in your face with all the forces of God against one frail person's pride. He will not let you get away with it because He loves you too much and He's determined to defeat that area of your life. So how do I respond when God gets in my face? Let's talk about that. This verse, James, we just read, tells me how I can respond when God gets in my face. So here's some guidelines. Number one, James says, submit and resist the devil. Submit to God and resist the devil. These are powerful commands. James did not just use an and to connect these two commands. Notice this. There wasn't 
Submit to God and resist the devil and he shall flee. It was submit to God, period. Resist the devil and he shall flee. There was a command given here, not a conjunction. Because grammatically he was saying that as you do one, you are in de facto doing the other. If you submit to God, you are by doing so resisting the devil. Submission and resistance are the heart of the issues. To submit is the idea of putting yourself under the leadership of another so that they can accomplish what they need or want to accomplish. So the question is, who's the leader of your life? I'm not saying me as pastor. I'm saying who's the leader of your life because you know what? When you leave these doors, I'm not going with you. I love you, but I'm not going with you. I'm not going to be on your job tomorrow. I'm not going to be there in your dark moments. Who's your leader? Well, you know, God is, of course. Really? Really? And why? Why is He the leader? Well, you know, because I come. I'm here today. No. No. That's, a, that's not what makes God the leader. Who makes the decisions in your life? Well, what, what do you mean? I, I pray about the big stuff. No, 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 no. Who makes the decisions? Who makes the decisions where you work, where you live? Ooh. We don't like that, do we? Who makes the decision who, what kind of car you drive? But I like this car. Well, you might. But what does God want? Oh, I, 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 I like this house. This house is perfect for me. Yeah, but what house does God want you to live in? Well, I've got, I said this before. I mean, we, the way we think, right, is if we're getting, we're getting, we got to get a job, right? So we go to two interviews. We go to interview A. Oh, you know, this, this is okay. Yeah, they're going to offer me uh, uh, $20,000. We're going to go over here to interview B. They're going to offer me $60,000. No brainer, 60 k It's obviously God wants me to have more money. Maybe. Or maybe in this position over here, there's a door, an opportunity for you that can't be over there. I, I said something similar to that several weeks ago, and some of you know him. Billy Miles had, uh, Billy uh, Miles has, was a part of Antioch for many years, grew up here, and he recently moved away. And he was telling me, he said, you know, it's funny, i got to tell you a testimony. I said, okay, tell me. He said, what you just said was, so, was so, such a confirmation to me. He said, about a year ago, whatever it was, I lost my job. And he said, he's an electrician. He said, I had to go get another job. And so I went on some interviews. And, and there was one, it was one interview that I, I liked the guy, I liked the company, and it was good. And then I went over another interview, and this guy was offering like $3, $4 more an hour, something like that. He's like, man, that's a lot of money. And the guy was like, you know, it's gotta be, this has got to be the one. And he said, for some reason, I had no idea, but I could not get peace or direction to take the job. And I'm like, for some reason, I feel like God wants to, me to take this job. And I'm like, God, what are you doing? This is obviously the wrong job. But he said, you know what? I just felt like that was, so he said, I took that, took the job. Come to find out. He took the job. And in taking the job that was less money and looked like it was a dead end, God gave him favor with the owner of the company. And now he is the second in command. Has Instead of working on a crew, he's in charge of all the crews. He didn't see that and didn't even know that from where he was because he put the choice in God's hands and didn't use your natural instincts God said, let me run your life. So who's in charge of your life? So number one, I got to submit to God. I got to resist the devil. That's a combination, but separate. You got to submit to resist. Number two, James says, draw near to God. A number of years before James wrote this, Jesus had made this statement. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What does that mean? I come and I sing. Lord, I love you. You're so awesome to me. I can't live without you, but my heart is far from him. Oh, we sing the song, right? I need thee. Oh, I need thee. 
Every hour on Sunday, I need thee. But when Monday comes, I'll be in charge again. But I need thee today, because it's Sunday. Yeah? That's probably more of a real realistic uh, lyric to that song. Every hour I need thee. Jesus said, I honor, you honor me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. James was referring to the same kind of heart when he said, draw near. The center and essence of one's life that has moved far from God. He calls you to approach God with a broken and contrite heart. To come before Him admitting that you have messed up and that you are broken. Saying you need Him and what only He can offer you. So easy. We're going to talk about this in, in the 11 o'clock hour. And I don't want to give it away, but we'll just get there because it fits so well. Peter denied Jesus. We know the story. Peter denied Jesus. But if you go back a few verses, you find out the reason how he got to the denying part. Luke tells us. Luke said that Jesus said to Peter, uh, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, I'm not doing that. He said, in fact, before the cock crows the third time, you're going to, okay, whatever. Then Jesus goes off to the garden to pray. The great climatic moment, Garden of Gethsemane, the great, all that stuff, right? And the Bible says that Peter went with him and fell asleep. And what's even crazy, the Bible, we'll read, we'll read it later. The Bible three times says Jesus tried to wake Peter up. Three times Jesus tried to wake him up. He didn't wake up. Finally, Jesus said, it's enough. They're coming. Three times Jesus tried to get him out of his slumber. Jesus tried to get him out of his lethargy, his apathetic attitude that here's this man who had so fervently told Jesus, where you go, I'm going to follow. I'm the rock on which the church will be built and I'm sleeping in your hour of need. And Jesus tried to wake him up. And then what happened? The Bible says that in the hour of Jesus' trial, it says it, and Peter followed from afar off. Peter followed from afar off. He distanced himself from God. And when he distanced himself from Jesus, he said, I don't even know who this man is. Can I be, I know I'm teaching, but can I just preach for five seconds? How many of you has God been trying to wake you up? How many of you, as Jesus said, wake up. Can't you just tear with me for one hour? Oh, but God, you don't know how much stuff's going on in my life. You don't know how weighted down I am. Yes, but if you don't understand, if you don't wake up and draw near to me, there's going to be a, come a point in time where you won't even follow me. No one leaves God overnight. Somewhere you start taking too many naps. You start sleeping through church. Oh, you're not sleeping physically, although that does happen. Hello. <laughs> Come on, let's just call it what it is. Hey, praise the Lord. If you're a preacher and you get offended because someone falls asleep, you're going, to have a, you're going to have a lot of offenses. No, we're not physically sleeping, but let's be honest. We spiritually sleep. We come and we do the vegetable thing. Uh, hallelujah, amen, amen, hallelujah. Because we've done it so many times, our spirit is asleep even though we're here in our body. And Jesus says, wake up! And we try to wake up, but we fall back asleep. And eventually, if we're not careful, we'll be like Peter and we'll follow from afar off. And he said, if you want to fix this, draw near. Draw near. If you want to fix your life, if you want to fix your actions, if you want to fix your attitude, if you want to fix your character, if you want to fix all those things we're talking about, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to submit and you've got to draw near again. You've got to get back to Jesus. Number three, he said, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. What does this mean? It means James challenges you to be honest and deal with your sin 
harbored in your heart. Come clean about the stuff that is weighing you down, the stuff you would prefer neither God nor anyone else to know about, even though he understands it's better, understand it better than you. Stop playing games with God in your heart, in your own heart and mind. Come to grips with how deeply embedded sin is in your life. Be honest with yourself and God about all of it. So how do I get near to him? i got to start being honest with myself and say, I need help. It's not a you problem. i got a me problem. Too many people have you problems. Not enough of us have me problems. The old song says, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mama, not my sister, not my brother, something like that. It's standing in the need of prayer. It's a me problem. It's not your husband problem. It's not a wife problem. It's not a kid problem. It's not a parent problem. It's not a job problem. It's not a circumstance problem. It's not a money problem. It's a you problem, baby. It's a you problem. And until you make it a you problem, you'll never get the solution. It's a you problem. But you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the life I'm living. I don't care what life you're living. It's a you problem. Number four, be miserable, mourn and weep. You know you're being honest with yourself and God about the sin entrenched in your life by how it impacts you. If you're truly honest about how deeply embedded sin is in your life, it will grip you, it will weigh you down, it will grieve deeply the reality that you have chosen independence from God rather than that. What do we call that? There's a word for that. It's called conviction. When you come to grips with where you are, you come to grips with your life, God will bring conviction in your life and you'll begin to realize, I don't want to be this way anymore. Amen. I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be in this place anymore. I don't want this to be the case. And God will grip us. God will grip our hearts. Finally, we go on number five. James says, humble yourselves before the Lord. So when you choose to put your heart back under the leadership of God, you let go of your pride enough to draw near to Him with a broken heart and you're honest with how deeply embedded sin is your life that it starts to grieve you, then it will not be nearly as hard to bow your knees before the heart of God in humility. A lot of us are trying to humble ourselves We're trying to figure out, how do I do that? I'm just humble myself. What am I supposed to do? I'm walking in like this. I'm humbled. I'm humbled. That's not humbleness. Humbleness is submission, drawing near to him, letting his love expose the things in my heart. I'm talking about the deep stuff. Come on. I'm talking about stuff we've kept hidden. I'm talking about the stuff that we, 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 we sort of have put way down into the deep recesses of our hearts. And finally, when you do all this, number six, James says, he will exalt you. What does that mean? Because when you know that you're being honest with yourself and God about the sin in your life, by how it impacts you, when you humble yourself, he will take you by the shoulders, lift you up and exalt you. It is not his desire for you to be miserable, but exalted. Lift it up, your head held high, because you're a man or woman who is right in your heart with God, the one in charge of you and everything else in your life. Do you know you can be like this and still be hu humble? You can walk around with your head held high and your shoulders back with a smile on your face, not because you're cocky, but because you're confident in who he is and what he's doing in your life. God's not expecting us to walk around with moping and groping. Well, I'm just a humble Christian and I'm just submitted to God and I have to go to gatherings every Sunday and pray and seek God. It's just what my life is. No, I'm happy because He exalts me. Because He's exalting me because I'm submitted to Him. So, full circle in the passage here. If you lift yourself up in pride... He will bring all the forces of heaven to humble you. If you humble yourself before Him, He will lift you up and exalt you. Notice the difference. If you put yourself up, God will smash you down. If you put yourself down, God will lift you up. 
So the question today is, do you feel oppressed or blessed? Because if you feel oppressed, maybe not the devil. Maybe there's some things in your heart that needs to be changed. But if you feel blessed and you feel lifted today and you got joy in your heart and you're happy, it has nothing to do with the fact you've got no problems because I know some of you have all hell breaking loose, but you're happy. Why? Because your heart is submitted to him. So notice this. This passage we've discussed in James is not an isolated passage. Peter who had such a, the same exact dude, we're going to talk about him later, the same guy who had such a pride in his heart and told Jesus, Jesus, you're wrong, this guy. Jesus needed Peter's advice and protection, said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He may exalt you at the proper time. That was the words of Peter. Why? Because we'll watch Peter's life and see how Peter went from prideful to humble. And when he went to humble, then God exalted him. It is a command it is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Humble yourselves before Him so He can exalt you. God never gives you a command without giving you what you need to be able to obey that command. You may not always do it, but He has provided a way of doing it if you will trust in Him and His power through you. All right, ready? God is in the process of changing you from the inside out. He knows your heart can be changed and you can humble your heart to be right with Him. So what are we saying? I'm saying, I don't really care what all you got going on on those outer rings if that center part is off. You must have throw everything away. Paul acknowledged this when he said, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Bowing the knees is an outward expression of an inward bowing of your heart before God. It is putting yourself under His sovereign and loving leadership in your life. Jesus built His primary message around this reality. In what has become known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus began with a series of true statements, verse four, four being progressive statements similar to what James wrote. We find these Matthew Chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. Let's read them really quickly. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they'll be comforted. Blessed are those that are gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So what does that mean? Number one, poor in spirit. Those who are bankrupt. These are the ones who are bankrupt in their own spirit. Devoid of any resources, as the word poor means here. They have tried everything. Amen? Anybody here can say that? You've tried everything, but finally came to the end of yourself as ones who, can, who, who cannot make your life happen on your own. You're bankrupt in your own spirit and spiritual abilities, and you know it. So number one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs are the kingdom of God. That means blessed are those that are spiritually bankrupt because you're about to write a million dollar check. Because you know what? You finally come to the end. I can't do this. I can't do this. Some of you are getting there, but you're trying to squeeze that last penny. That last penny of pride, that last penny of self-will. Number two, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Just like in the previous passage we wrote in James, those who mourn have come to realize and admit how deeply embedded sin is in their life to the point that it grieves them and they mourn. Jesus said part of the maturing process is realizing and grieving over how deeply sin is embedded in your life. Number three, blessed are the gentle for they shall inherit the earth. We said several weeks ago, the word gentle does not in, insist on having their own way. Those who are gentle are people that have stopped trying to have their own way. They've stopped resisting and come to the realization that it's a futile attempt at best. They give up 
trying to force life and others to fit into their own prescribed way of doing things and stop trying to control their own life and others around them. All of these pictures are somehow progressively coming to the end of self. They have been defeated when, they, when trying to make life work on your own terms and have come to the end which leads us to the fourth statement. So all these are showing progression. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is what's going to happen. Blessed are those who mourn. This is what's going to happen. It's a progression. Finally gets to the last one. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The King James says filled. Those here who hunger and thirst are not describing what it's like to be hungry and thirsty because it's mealtime. They are in terms of desperation. A feeling like you could die if you do not have something to eat or something to drink. This person longs to have God's kind of life, righteousness. They've tried their way, and it just doesn't work. So what happens? The, Brother Jolin, the more I get in this posture, the more there's a fervency in my life and heart to just want to know Jesus. The more I become bankrupt in my own abilities, the more, that I, the more I realize that I've got a me problem and I start to realize that's, a, that's the issue. It's a me problem. When I get all these things and they start to work and I start to realize that this is what's going on and, and, and I realize that I've become gentle because I realize I can't, I got to stop resisting God. When all this stuff happens, there is a supernatural opening in me, sort of like the, the reverse of Pandora box something in me breaks and there is a desire that is unleashed in me to know Jesus we talked here before we say you know what you gotta know Jesus you're like I know but I don't know how to do that so you go out there and you're like I gotta know Jesus I gotta know Jesus I gotta know Jesus I, I gotta know Jesus I gotta know Jesus I gotta know I gotta know Jesus. I gotta know Jesus. I gotta know Jesus. I gotta know Jesus. What do I do? I gotta know Jesus. Okay, here's what I gotta do. I gotta pray every day. Okay, five minutes today. Let's do it. Ready, set, go. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. I love you, Jesus. Three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. I love you, Jesus. Awesome. You're so good. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 299, 300 seconds. Five minutes. God, I know you now, Jesus. Oh, I got to read a scripture. Read a scripture. Got to read a scripture. That's knowing Jesus. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was out form, and it was void, and darkness was on the face of the earth. Whew, got it. Okay. I did the two things. Check box. Check box. I'm going to know him here soon. It's coming. Right? And we do all these things, and what do we do? Prayer is absolutely painful. And reading the Bible is like trying to read an alien book. It makes no sense and has no relevance to us. And so what do we do? We give up on all of it. But it's, that's not the problem. The problem is we didn't start with the correct steps. And the correct steps are, i got to realize I can't run my own life i got to stop running my own life. And i got to realize i got a me problem. And when I get all this stuff realized, i got a me problem, and I stop resisting God, then all of a sudden, without even realizing it, I get up on Monday morning and I say, Jesus, I need you today. Walk with me, Jesus. Be with me, Jesus. Where I go, God, don't let me go. Don't let me just go on my own way. Wherever you lead me, God, I'm going to follow. When I'm in the car at work, going to work, I'm not just... Wasting away, but I'm saying, God, be with me today. Let me walk in your will. Let me walk in your spirit. All of a sudden now, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm on my way home saying, thank you, Jesus, for a day that you blessed me with. I had hell and problems and difficulty and struggle. All of a sudden, wait a minute. I get home, and instead of praying for five minutes, I've walked with Jesus all day long. And the last thing I do when I lay my head on my pillow is say, thank you, Jesus, for another day you blessed me with. Now instead of it being a trial and a test and a laborious time-keeping thing of walking with him five minutes a day, i got to get my five minutes in, I'm actually learning to know him because I've stopped trying to run my own life. When I stop trying to run my life, I've got to rely on him to run my life. And when, I, when I realize the more I try to run my life, the more I mess it up. Ready? If you haven't written anything down, here's another good one. you got to write this down. Here's a good one. Ready? You will never be desperate for God in his kind of life 
until you have come to the end of thinking and living as if you can make life work yourself. One more time, I read that. Write it down, tweet it, stamp it, Facebook it, post it, pick, do something. You will never be desperate for God and His kind of life until you have come to the end of thinking and living as if you can make life work yourself. This life-changing progression is profound. You will never be desperate for God in His kind of life until you come to that point. But when you come to the end of trying to make life work on your own, denying yourself and turning to Him in desperation, He will satisfy your most desperate needs and it all begins in your heart. Where is your heart? Today. Are you stubbornly determined to make life work on your own? Can we just finally say enough of that? Please. Can someone today make up your mind, enough is enough. Accept God as the ruler and master of your life. Open your heart to Him. Be honest about the sin you have been hiding and protecting to the point that you realize how deeply embedded it is in your life and grieves you. Bow the knees of your heart before Him and is waiting. We say, wait a minute. Okay, time out. I, I, I got a question. Um, I don't have a lot of sin in my life. I haven't shot anybody lately. I haven't, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't done anything crazy. I don't have sin. But you know what the greatest sin the Bible points out? Lawlessness. It's the sin of running your own life. Doing your way. That's the truth. That's the, that's the, 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 the core of it all. There is an often overlooked picture and almost to the end I've got 10 minutes there's an often overlooked little picture in the book of Joshua that is very powerful to consider in the context of all this let's go back for a moment Joshua is taking over the leadership of the nation of Israel he had been uh, biding his time with all the stuff going on walking around the desert for 40 years and you know the story came out of all that and spies and all that so Joshua has been walking around for 40 years biding his time and so he's taking over the leadership and all those that rebelled against God and the leadership of Moses had started to die. And then Joshua took them across the Jordan River to the Promised Land and he prepared to take the city of Jericho, that first one, that heavily fortified, that, 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 the gateway to the Promised Land. And he had this encounter, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, a man standing opposite of him, a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, No, rather I needed, I indeed come now as the captain of the Lord of hosts. Joshua must have been a little startled to see this man out of nowhere standing there with a sword in his hand. And he's basically asking, Are you going to fight with me or against me? And the stranger asked this provocative question, no. No? But it was the Lord who was asking, who is leading this army, Joshua? Who's going to lead this army in the battle? He knew something Joshua had lost sight of. And what was that? The question was not whether man was going to follow Joshua's leadership, but would Joshua follow God's leadership? The angel showed up that day and asked Joshua, not if man was going to follow Joshua, but who was Joshua going to follow? And Joshua thought of himself as the one in charge of the battle, but Jesus changed his perspective. He said, I'm the commander in chief. And he wanted Joshua to be part of what he was doing, not the other way around. Are you a part of what God's doing or is he a part of what you're doing? God bless me today. I got to go do this, doing this and bless me. That's God being a part of your life. But when you say, God, where do you want me to go today? That's you be a part of his life. I don't care how spiritual it sounds, it's still you in control. If you think of this life as your battle to fight, you need to change your perspective and realize it's his battle to fight and win. He just wants you to be on his team. He does not want you to be an, alter uh, an uh, uh, alternative or fallback 
in case you need His help. He is the master, the Lord, the leader of your life, and your life will change. He is leading all the powers of heaven to change you. But are you willing to bow your heart to His leadership? Watch what happens. So here's the big question, right? Let's go back and read it one more time so you know what, we're, what the question was. The, the, he, the, he said, are you for us for the adversaries? He said, no, rather I need come as the captain of the Lord of hosts. And then Joshua's response was this. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, bowed down and said, what has my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord of hosts said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Notice that. Your response to God's call will determine who's in charge today. If you say today, well, I don't have this problem in my life, that's proven that you're resisting. Because if your attitude is today, you say, God, I don't know, but God, if I need to be submitted to you again, God, check me today. Check every part of me today. Because watch what Josh, Joshua's response was a, sub, was a response of submission. How God is going to change your heart is found in this deal because God confronted Joshua face to face in the middle of nowhere. How is he working to change your heart and bring you to a, the precipice of being humbly submitted to him? Are you recognizing that what he is doing so that you can get on the same page and get in step with what he is already doing? I finish with this, and I've got these, and I'm going to pass them out. Just a little example, but something maybe you can just take as a reminder, maybe small group today, you can have a discussion on them. Get some of you guys to help me pass these out. Here you go, you guys. I'll just take the one. You're going to receive this today, and it's just a, a discussion starter, or maybe just a, a, chat, a thought process beginner in your own. Whether or not you discuss it with anybody else, it will help sort of get the dialogue started in your own mind and spirit, maybe give you something to pray about. And it's just simply this. It says this at the top. Here are some of the ways I've noticed God is working in my life to help me increasingly submit my heart to Him. Remember we talked about several weeks ago, we said, how do I know God's working? We got to recognize. We got to recognize. I, I told the story as funny as it was, and it was funny and frustrating at the same time. I backed into my wife's, I backed my wife's van into my truck and wrecked two vehicles at one time. And I recognize, you know what? God is using this to teach me and to reveal some things in my heart and spirit. So that same deal. What is God in your life doing? So here's some examples. Maybe God chose to break my pride through painful experiences. Maybe God's using some pain. Pain of loss. Pain of rejection. Pain of broken Dreams, broken relationships, something. Maybe God's using that pain that you're trying to resist, that pain that you're trying to run from. Maybe God's using that pain as a process to humble you. Maybe that pain that you're so desperate to get rid of will be the pain that brings you to your knees so God can save you. We don't want that part of God. We want the happy part. Everything works together for good to them that are called according to His purpose. Not the pain, but it's the pain that brings the broken and contrite heart. What about maybe God's allowed me to experience the emptiness and die dryness of a prideful heart. Maybe you're somebody today that God is working to submit your heart because you're starting to realize I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to go one more day feeling empty. I don't want to go one more day feeling this way. I don't want to go one more day with this dry religion and this dead relationship and this go through the motion fake it Christianity. But I want the real and genuine thing. Maybe this. How about this one? Maybe God got your attention 
by looking at the ugliness and prideful heart and people that you love and are surrounded with. Maybe you've seen some people around you that have at one time may have walked with God or at one time may have been this, but you've watched what pride has done to them and the desire, I don't want that to happen to me. It's not judging. Well, you're judging. It's not judging. It's the fact that you see somebody and you can watch what happens to them when bitterness and junk gets in their heart and it begins to rip away and pride begins to take over. And you say, God, please don't let this happen to me. Whatever you've got to do to me, don't let this happen. Or maybe God uses precious moments to draw here, not everything has got to be doom and gloom. Not everything's got to be fire and brimstone. Maybe you're just sitting here today as, you're here, if you, as you heard this teaching and maybe you just feel that small tug. Maybe you're just feeling that gentle, gentle tug of God as He reaches down in this place and reaches to you and says, come on Angie, just take my hand and go a little farther. Come on, just let me help you in your life. Come on, I know things, I know where you are, I can see where you are. Just let me take you. And as you just say, okay God, oh God, whatever you got to do, Lord, I just want to be near to you. I want to be close to you. As you begin to open up your heart, God says, now I can begin to change you. Maybe there's other things today. That was just an example of some things. Maybe God can lead you in directions and, and other things. But take these things. Pray about it. Say, God, are you changing my heart? And if you are, help me to understand how you're changing it. So instead of running from the change, I can embrace the change. Because I gotta tell you something. Some of you are trying to run from the things God's actually took you through because He wants to submit you and humbly submit you and help your heart. And you're trying to change it. So instead of praying for God to get you out of it, you can start praying in the book of James. It says, give me great grace. I don't need grace. I need greater grace. Because I'm not going to quit until you're done. I don't want to stop until you finish what you started. Amen. Father, we thank you today. Love you. Thank you for the work you're doing in the hearts and lives of people Thank you for the testimonies that have come back from those that are saying that they're being challenged to be more like Jesus. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing. Thank you for the seed of your word that's starting to be implanted into the hearts of the people of Antioch West and the fruit that's beginning to show in our lives, not just on Sunday, but the fruits that are beginning to show in our life every day of the week. God, I pray today, let us have a heart that's submitted to you. Whatever it takes, God. Whatever it takes, God. Help us so that we can submit our hearts to you. That our heart can be submitted to you and be under your control. That you can be the leader of our life. I pray all these things, speak all these things in Jesus' name.